Hello and welcome to the Four Hammer Podcast, episode 65. I'm your host, Brad. This is my co-host, Eric. How's it going? And we're keeping this intro short because I have a lot of things I want to talk about and I don't have much of a plan. So without any further ado, we're going to have a discussion on the new Lion book, Arcs of Omens finale, 40k lore in general, Primarchs. We're talking about a lot is the point. So let's jump in. Sounds good. So I think first off, we're not going to like focus on like spoiling stuff, but there are going to be spoilers. No, more first off. I'm very aware that 10th edition is coming out. Well, okay, so I had thought about this and we could talk about 10th edition that was just, you know, there's a bunch of news that went on and be two weeks late. Or next week, we just make shit up, and then we'll be three weeks early. (laughs) We'll just guess ahead. Yeah. (laughs) For those of you wondering why we're not talking about 10th edition stuff yet, today for us is May the 3rd. If you are watching this on YouTube and I launched this on the correct day, that is like nine to ten days ago. Yep. We're not going to be first on giving you any information. (laughs) We're not even going to be, like, in the top 100. (laughs) The information available for 10th edition has doubled. Every day, Warcom has released an article. We're rapidly approaching, and, I mean, we just can't do that kind of turnaround. And just kind of boring to talk about stuff that is going to be late anyways. They just showed off Synapse today. To you, this is old news. Very cool stuff. I have thoughts. I had a lot of interesting thoughts on specifically today's article with the Tyranid stuff, but... But once 10th edition is, like, solidified and, like, there's not, like, oh, every day there's new stuff, then we'll talk. And to give you, like, the only piece of information that matters, the Screamer Killer looks like he went to the barber and said, give me the wharf. So now he looks like (laughs) Worf from Star Trek. You'll never be able to unsee it, and it is the worst head they have ever put on any model. (laughs) Okay, so 10th edition isn't going to happen on this episode. We're going to talk lore, and lore that's old, too. (laughs) <laughs> so uh, before we get into this episode's lore, as a reminder, the book club for The Infinite and the Divine, the 40k book club episode where we're going to be spoiling a book in detail, will be coming out on the week of June 6th. You have that long to read that book. We will not hold back on spoilers on that book. It's going to be great to talk about, though. All right, but to lay down the ground rules for this discussion, finally, I will not spoil anything of the plot of this book after the first act. I'm giving myself the first act to talk about things because I need content to talk about. (laughs) And I think that's kind of the stuff that I vaguely know. Like, I haven't read the book. And just, like, being, reading some more com articles here and there, I feel like that's not going to be a huge spoiler for anybody that's even interested in it at all. There is almost nothing in this book that could be considered a spoiler other than for the plot of this book. That is because I am going into this discussion with it in mind that you have read the Warcom article at minimum for the end of Arcs of Omen. It's available online for free to everybody. It is current 40k lore. It was advertised a hundred billion times to everyone when The Lion came out and everything else. They really hyped it up and then gave everyone the Cliff Notes version of this poorly written series and are Aren't you glad you didn't pay $65 for this trash? <laughs> yeah, I think we'll have like a link in the show notes or whatever if you somehow missed it. Go read that. But yeah, this book takes place before that. So congrats, you know everything after this book. I did enjoy reading the article and it's like, okay, plot, plot, plot. This is what's happening. Then at the end, it's just like, and we don't care about this section anymore. We're going to jump to the other side where Tyranids are doing something. <laughs> it's like, okay. Cool. (laughs) Nothing has any meaning. Great. Nope. Not in 40k. Which we can get into in this discussion. But Eric, before I explain to you the book, I have read the book. I finished it 25 minutes ago based off what my phone says. Hey man, that's like pretty stellar. You did your homework on time. I know, I really wanted to finish the book comfortably and instead I decided we had to record a day early because I forgot it was date night. (laughs) I can't believe you forgot about our date night on Wednesday. Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. So you've got thoughts on how to do this. I mean, I, I haven't read the book, so you're kind of in charge. Okay. So this is mostly going to be me rambling, but to start off for entertainment value, Eric, who has not read the book, you've only read the information that everybody has. Yeah. What do you think happened in this book? Give me a detailed summary of everything that happened. Total spoilers, everything. Uh, the lion's back and he like was a badass how'd he come back eric uh magic pixie dust okay what do you do once he got back well he obviously linked up with all of his friends and went on a crusade this is fantastic completely accurate very much lines up with the point you know happens at the end of arcs of omen <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, the whole thing was around Vashtor having some huge giga plan to do something that was bad that maybe they explained it, but it sounded like it was like, here's a MacGuffin that the Imperium needs to deal with before it finishes being a MacGuffin. Then who's the guy that leads the Dark Angels? Dante? No, Ezreal. Is it Azrael? Azrael leads the Dark Angels. Dante leads the Blood Angels. Okay, same thing. Close enough. Good enough. And they figure out where Vashdor is somehow. I'm sure it was super awesome detective work. That sounds like what Space Marines do. And it was like obviously a trap because, you know, insert meme. And then it was like, I don't know, something about a fucked up planet that was theirs before that disappeared and is now back but in like Vashtor madness method whatever Vashtor does to planets I don't know man and so they decided to say fuck it to strategy and just charged in even though it was clearly a trap and then got their asses kicked and then the lion shows up and is like hey I brought some friends you're like lamely trying to re-talk about the arcs of omen finale I wanted to know what happens in lion son of the forest is there other things that happen in the lion? Lion Son of the Forest has nothing to do with that. Really? It happens before it. It happens before it. So this is like the lead up to how lion shows up? Yes. Oh. <laughs> what happens in this book, Eric? I don't know, dude. I haven't read it. I know. That's the joke. The patrons wanted this to be the episode. They wanted an episode of you having not read it, telling me the story of the book. Ah, okay. Little did they know that Eric has a mental illness where he is incapable of making a fantasy. It's true. I can't write stories, man. It's horrible. Okay, so The Lion, Son of the Forest is about how the lion was lost in chaos and had to go on a grand adventure, an epic perhaps you would call it, to learn about himself, the past, so that he can become a better person for the future. At which point, once he figured out who he actually is, he was able to escape the chaos and return back to 40k just in time to save his friends. <laughs> Nailed it. This is the deep lore of 40k with Eric. Fucking nailed it. <laughs> All right. So uh, Eric's retelling out of the way. Let's actually talk about this now. So Arcs of Omen takes place after Lion, Son of the Forest. Lion, Son of the Forest tells us the story of Lion entering the 41st millennia from wherever he's been for the last 10,000 years. Okay, so far I'm on track. The end point being, in Arcs of Omen, Dante shows up to save Asriel from Vashtor's trap where he like brings Caliban back or whatever. Yeah. And he's like, also, I've got your primarch with me and angron's there because they just made his model and he had to be there for the story so that they could have all the new models there yeah that didn't really make any sense nothing makes sense with the end of arcs of omen it's horrendously bad there's vashtor and then there's angron and there's also abaddon and it's like let's just throw names out the fucking sheet and see what happens so i gave you the out of just reading the little article thing that's only like 10 paragraphs long that they gave out to everybody yeah yeah the full story doesn't make it any better i don't imagine it would the plot points on that are very it reminds me a lot of 80s comics trying to sell a toy yes 
Like, here's G.I. Joe. The Transformers or G.I. Joe cartoon. Yeah. That is Arcs of Omen finale. And I mean, perhaps that actual writing is better. Like, I read the Cliff Notes version, and obviously those are going to be less exciting, but... I did not, and the Cliff Notes aren't that much worse. (laughs) (laughs) Fair enough. Not the best writing I've ever read in my life. And it's just so stupid. Yeah. Parts of it make me angry. It's written like chaos wins. But when you write down the facts, it's like Angron gets his head exploded. Yeah, but he'll be back. Vashor fucks off after having done nothing. I mean, he completed his master plan of get the MacGuffin. That's a big deal. It's apparently going to destroy the uh, Imperium. Abaddon fucks off after having done literally nothing. Why was he there? (laughs) Because they wanted to be like, Abaddon, look, hey, it's Abaddon. Because they wanted Abaddon there. Yeah, they wanted to be able to say like, oh, the Primarch fought three great demons and came out alive. Technically, Abaddon's not a demon, but yeah. Eh, close enough. So uh, Chaos gets their asses handed to them, but because Vashtor shits on the front porch of the dark angels it's treated like a major loss to the imperium yeah except like the thing was already lost he just like brought it back and showed that it was fucked up he turned their dead cat into a marionette right like (laughs) it's already you've already had the loss yeah it's it sucks it's definitely not a cool thing to do vashdor quit being a dick it's fucked up but like it's fucked up and i guess you could call that a major chaos win because he did that showed them and ran away yeah and like i get the greater use of the MacGuffin he stole but it will never come into play because because nothing does. But anyway, Arcs of Omen is written horrendously bad. And it's unfortunate that the lion leads up to this. <laughs> because the lion throughout the book is very well written. Mike Brooks wrote it. I've been told he's a fantastic author. This is the first of four books I own of his that I have been meaning to read. That I finally sat down and read. It was very good. Wow. Yeah, and then it leads to Arcs of Omen's finale. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that's got to be even more disappointing than just being like a bad book. Yeah. If it was a bad book, you can throw it away. But this is a good book that is that I know where this goes. Yeah. Okay. Here's the plus side. Arcs of Almond was a campaign book. And as I've stated before, campaign books aren't real. They can't hurt you. They disappear the second they're done being sold. There's no real important story in any of them. I guess technically someone did correctly point out the fall of Cadia takes place in the background of several books. There's not an actual actual book about that event other than the really poorly written Gathering Storm campaign books, which I also suffered through. I totally found legal copies of that four-year-old book, by the way, I'm sure. I'm sure. I like how you're like, (laughs) I'm sure I did that. (laughs) i don't know why i would do anything else they released it in really poorly scanned pdfs right guys (laughs) so anyway they're sales pitch stories they're there to sell new models yeah but it is something that constantly marred the lion for me because i was reading a good book and i was getting towards the end i was like damn i love where this is going i can't wait to read more (laughs) adventures i got to the end and i was like oh I know where this goes. And it's unfortunate because I I would read a sequel to this book that takes place between this and the Arcs of Omen. Oh, so this doesn't actually, like, it doesn't end with, like, him meeting up and, like... It does not end at the start of the Arcs of Omen thing I had you read. It ends at a plot point that is very clearly the, like, oh, I see how he gets from point A to point B. Okay. But it is a solidly written story. It has amazingly well-written characters within it that I liked a lot. Really? It made me like Lionel Johnson, which is shocking, because while I've not suffered through much of 30K's setting, well, when I say I haven't suffered through much of 30K's setting... You've only went through, like, 50% of it. I've probably spent 20 to 30 hours reading stuff about it. I've not sat down and read the 58 books in the Horus Heresy series. <laughs> I'm aware of the contents of the general plot beats, but I've not suffered through reading all that. It makes sense, because you don't really like the Imperium. Correct, but I need to understand it because I enjoy the game, and half of all things in this game rely on men in tin cans. I mean, a lot of lore that's not Space Marines is told with a Space Marine tint. Correct. 
So, yeah, it makes sense. But I am surprised that you say that you enjoyed the characters in this because you generally hate these types of characters that are Imperium, Space Marine. So let's start talking about the book itself. Now that we got the Arcs of Omen rant out of the way and we now have our bearings for what I will and will not talk about. This book starts with a dream sequency thing that you figure out by the end of it. You figure out within like the first 30 seconds sort of and then within a minute and a half you're like got it stop i get it is it like uh one of those like ethereal type dream things it's a warpy thing it's warp magic is it like oh this is all allegories to this other stuff they assume you are a 12 year old boy (laughs) we really need to hit you over the head with a hammer to make sure you understand he gets to a clearing and he finds a lake and in the lake there is a boat (laughs) <laughs> with an old king in it the old king is bleeding in the water and is yeah. surrounded by dark shadows that are swimming in circles around him not attacking him but at any moment could kill him this frail old king who is wounded and sitting in the boat on the water in this mysterious it's like okay we get it it's the emperor is he in a chair on the boat <laughs> the infuriating part is like dude lion How do you not get this? It kills me when it's that, like, your main character is an idiot. Yeah, it's like one of those, you get experience about the current events and, like, what's happening because somebody's assuming that your main character is just a complete idiot and needs to give you exposition. To be fair, in the first dream sequence of this, Lionel Johnson has amnesia. All right. So he doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know who the man in the boat is or anything like that. I could see that being a valid reason. So it starts like that. The dream sequency warp thing ends and we get into the story proper. And that is how we are introduced to the lion entering 40K. Now he is in the 41st millennium with amnesia on a random planet. Oh, okay. There's a massive gap. That's just like, yeah, he had amnesia. He woke up here. He wakes up in his warp dream thing from a nap. Nice. (laughs) Hell of a nap. (laughs) So as a external thing to this book, it's like one of the main things that I've always been told and have never researched the origin of is the lion is asleep within the rock. And like even the dark angels don't know he's sleeping in the rock, which is their home base asteroid ship thing bullshit. I mean, yeah, even I've seen that. Yeah, it's a basic like 40k fact that you learn early on and you go, got it, whatever. And it's like, yeah, okay, that's so dumb. It makes sense. (laughs) So to get this out of the way, in 30k, lion is insufferable prick, causes a bunch of problems that could be solved by literally having five words of conversation. I don't know, man, that could result in like emotions at some point. Can't have those. When a moment could be solved by a a little bit of tact or any sort of like politicking or, you know, empathy between two people, the lion's not your man. (laughs) He's barely capable of speaking a sentence and he's fueled mostly by pride and rage. This is Lion in 30k from everything I've gathered. This is accurate to the Lion in the Alfarius book. This is accurate to everything I've ever been told about him, and including in this book. It sounds a lot like everything you hate about Space Marines. Sort of. It's what I hate about 30k, which is one of my notes here on my secret notepad you can't see. (laughs) I have 30k versus 40k Lion and my problem with 30k. And the real reason he hasn't shown me is because all of the misspellings. No. Uh, I have no misspellings in this because I can spell. Bullshit. No one can prove otherwise. Yeah. Because it's a notepad and it doesn't tell you it's underlined in red as it's misspelled. So back to this. The lion enters the 41st millennium with amnesia. Okay. He saves some people from some monsters, goes back with them to their town. They're under siege by evil people. He goes to their town to meet their protector. Their protector is a dark angel who is obviously one of the fallen. They're the non-chaos, but also traitor, something like that. Or is it the other way? Half of the Dark Angels betray the Imperium. The Fallen are the half that betray them. So he's one of the Fallen. He sees the Lion. The Lion sees him, and his amnesia disappears, and he goes, Oh, fuck, I'm Lionel Johnson. This is one of my sons. He's pulling out his guns. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. (laughs) 
uh, fucking needs to go out and pick up milk again, dude. <laughs> so they tussle, yell at each other. You betrayed me. You betrayed me. No, you no you. Oops. It was all a big misunderstanding. You were a terrible father. Yeah. He gets called that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Spoilers, basically every Primarch gets called that one other than maybe Gilliman. I can't imagine why with their uh, stellar... Just the best track records across the board. You've got a couple good ones. You've got like Vulcan, Khan... The two missing ones. Gilliman. <laughs> <laughs> Sanguinius, but he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> on screen dead <laughs> so anyway this is where we get into the whole like 30k versus 40k lion the majority of this book is split between the viewpoints of the lion and the first fallen that you meet who he has this tussle with on this planet who i really like as a character by the way <laughs> And it's basically split 50-50 between them other than like one or two chapters where you get someone else's point of view. So is this planet complete backwater, whatever? This is a backwater in Imperium Nihilus, so it's on the wrong side of the rift. It's with Dante getting fucked up where no one can help. Okay, but it's also like just the middle of nowhere, which is why... Yes, and it's split between the two of them, and you get a lot of first person of the lion, which helps tremendously with fixing his character. And one of my problems with 30 k in general which is for 40k to happen every character in 30k has to be a dumbass <laughs> because smart people can't allow 30k to end where it does so that 40k happens fair enough yeah so if you want to return a primarch to 40k and you want them to not be like angron where him being an idiot is the thing not all of them can be that you can't you have to have like actual interesting characters hey man angron's awesome uh -huh. I actually, 30k Angron is interesting, but this book is basically a lot of the lion going, man, I was a fucking dickhead. Man, <laughs> what a dumbass I was. It only took me a millennia to grow up. And essentially every character you meet who remembers the lion in 30k is like, this new guy can't be the lion. It has to be an imposter because this guy isn't a complete prick. <laughs> And he's actually thinking, which my dad never did. The perfect disguise. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I very much enjoy that this book spends the majority of its runtime fixing the character so that future stories with him in this setting can make him a likable protagonist. Question on that. Is he normal size for a space marine? No, Primarchs are essentially to space marines as space marines are to humans. Right. So, like, that seems like it would be pretty glaringly obvious to everyone. People don't go, oh, he's just a space marine. They go, oh, he's probably some dark warp magic pretending to be my dead hero ah okay yeah no that's fair you can trust nothing in this setting and everything you've ever known is garbage why would you believe something good is happening to you well i mean i wouldn't assume that that was a good thing anyways but true because again that's another great point is no one actually assumes that even if it is him that they would be happy to see him <laughs> why why would that be a good thing <laughs> But, yeah. So, I really do like that fact. And it's one of my major, like, positives of this book, is you get a lot of the Lion's first-person thoughts, which is something I've appreciated with reading the Dark Imperium trilogy with Gilliman. I would say I've almost had about, like, half as much of the Lion at this point, because Gilliman, while he's a main character of the Dark Imperium trilogy, there are more characters in total, so you get less of him. Right. Okay, question. Is the vast majority of interactions the lion speaking in his own head or is he actually like projected outwards as well oh man this gets into a good thing so here's one of my only faults in this book i get the reasoning of it but it's very awkward to my brain and i don't know if this is a me thing or if a lot of people will have this if the chapter is from the lion's perspective, it's in present tense. If it's from anyone else's, it's past tense. That's horrendously awful to read. Because you get the same scene, continuations from chapter to chapter. You switch whose perspective you're in. Okay, so you're in like an actual person's perspective. If it's a the lion chapter, it is 
he moves, he says, and then it switches to anyone else, and it's, at the time I was feeling this. And this is the same scene, it's a continuation of the scene. Ah, okay, okay. This fucks with my brain, but I get that it had to be the present tense to make the dreamlike qualities of his forest walk work. Right. Because when he's amnesiac in the beginning and everything, and then it would be weird if only that part is present tense to make that feel dreamy, and then you switch to past tense for the rest of the book, it would be awkward. So instead they went with a different awkward. I There wasn't a winning situation. I see what you're saying. I think that's the kind of thing that has, it happens. Like that. that's not an unheard of. I can't think of a book that does it that I've read. They all tend to stay to one of the two. Yeah. It's just a weird thing to constantly go back and forth in my brain with. But to answer your actual question, yes, there is a lot of the lion talking to other people. It's not all internalized. Okay, back to the actual things I want to mention for this first act and everything. Yeah. The lion essentially, in three seconds, decides, hey, the last thing I was doing in 30k that I remember was raiding my homeworld of Caliban to kill all those traitorous fallen who were under Luther and end the bad part of my gene line. And then I was here. And it turns out, after beating one of my sons nearly to death (laughs) and having him tell me what a piece of shit traitor I am, that he thought I was betraying the Imperium and he was loyal, maybe, maybe that was all a big misunderstanding. Wow. Character growth. And in three seconds, he goes, well, uh, I forgive you. Oops, my bad. Let's be friends. And the fallen are forgiven for any Dark Angel player out there. (laughs) Just like blanket, everybody's forgiven on that one. And that's kind of his thing through the book. Obviously, there is exception to his rule, but he basically makes the blanket rule of, I need all of my sons. I need any one of them who can help me. What if they're actually like a piece of shit, though? I don't care what you did up till this point. Uh I don't care if you were a traitor up until this point. If you come to me and swear loyalty to my cause and swear to lay down your life for the people that I am trying to defend, then you may work for me again and you are forgiven. But if you continue to be a piece of shit, I'll kill your ass. (laughs) There's no uh, cross fingers behind the back. No. And while the decision feels unnaturally instantaneous, I'm okay with it because it undoes the thing I complained about I think in two episodes now when I explained the Dark Angels. Yeah. They're a one trick pony. It's the Fallen. The Fallen. We must stop the Fallen. They betrayed us 10,000 years ago. They must be captured and killed and tortured etc. Right. And anyone who finds out that they did it needs to die so that we can keep the secret of their betrayal. Yeah. The, the whole keep the secret thing is always like. This story beat had to die. Because there could be only one story for all of Dark Angel history if this book did not change that. Okay. So I get it. I'm very happy with the outcome. Feels slightly unnatural, but it kind of had to. You have to rip that band-aid off. Yeah, that's fair. I feel like there could have been more time that could have been like, oh, he was gone for a while. Let's see where he was. To be fair, this is an interesting thing of like, what he learns early on, basically by talking to his first son he meets, is during the breaking of Caliban or whatever the fuck happened where Caliban shot at his forces. His forces decided to exterminate us Caliban and at the same time for some reason he looney tunes down to the planet with some of his forces to hand slay everyone on a planet that was being exterminate just for good measure I guess so he could have a dramatic death in 30k. Sounds right. So anyway that's what occurred and then poof Caliban, I guess, gets pulled into the warp by some ritual or something that was going on on the planet. Everyone gets lost in time and space. Doctor Who music plays, and everyone starts popping back into reality at some point between 30k and 40k. Really? This was all just a huge plan of uh, Vashdor? Uh, (laughs) From start to finish. The lion ending up on the planet. It's all Vashtor. Yeah, so uh, do you want to know Vashtor's main role in this plot? Oh, was he actually like a thing? No, he was not a thing in Caliban and 30k. He was made up 10 minutes ago by GW. But do you want to know his point in this book? Sure. He's not there. He has nothing to do with it. Sounds right. Yeah. (laughs) They get shoehorned together because their models came out at the same time. Yeah, very much. Sounds right. (laughs) This book is about the lion. (laughs) 
So from his perspective, Caliban was minutes ago, right? Yeah. And he's like, oh, I guess the thing that just occurred was kind of a misunderstanding and only the people in charge are to blame for it. I would like to talk to them about if they think I was the traitor or if they knew they were the traitor other than Luther, who I definitely believe was a traitor. Okay. So you have the point of view then of his son, who is a renegade Marine, which is different than a chaos Marine for those who don't know. They're the ones I actually really, really like. There's a renegade Marine in Aramon and... And he's a really interesting character. Oh, yeah. They're just, like, not helping the Imperium. <laughs> it's Marine who is hated by the Imperium for whatever reason. Yeah. Insert betrayal or whatever. But is not aligned with chaos. They're just hated by the Imperium. Yeah. It's just, like, normal bloke almost. They tend to end up either as, like, pirates or quiet, cloaked figures who are giant who try to <laughs> blend in on one of the infinite worlds full of fucking weirdos. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. They all super blend in. Just like a normal person. That gets talked about in this book and in Alfarius' book too of like because Ogrins and stuff exist and are like a part of Imperial society, a space marine who doesn't wear their armor can blend in if they like hide their jacked nature and just like stumble around like a drunk simpleton Ah. Uh, and just pretend to be an Ogrin. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. So you get a bunch of renegade marine stuff and I I really like that viewpoint and it's honestly like my favorite angle for a space marine because you get to actually experience a space marine with intelligence and like for a space marine to be a space marine you always get told they are so intelligent they are so smart while constantly being shown that they're like a high school jock with like no fucking brain power or they'd be like what the hell am i working in yeah i mean it's very clearly they bought into the propaganda machine of either the imperium or chaos gods yeah, yeah i do it I, either <laughs> way yes which is why i really like the renegade viewpoint and you get a lot of exposure to renegades and chaos in this there is some really cool scenes with chaos focused stuff some neat chaos relics get shown off lots of fun stuff on the chaos side of things too but the renegade perspective is more rare and in my opinion is really underutilized in most 40k stuff yeah, and it makes sense because it does give you a unique perspective that's outside of the the two-party system of Space Marine, Chaos Space Marine, where it's like just trying to survive in this fucked up universe. Like, they're still super soldiers, but... They don't have the backing of a military force. You've got 10 rounds left to work with. Exactly. It's kind of an interesting take on what's going on, and there's definitely a lot more freedom in what you can do. And that's why I end up liking the character so much in this. While we're on the subject of characters and chaos, this book does the thing that I've wished 40k would do. Eric, do you know what Zangor are? Shitty models that they give away for free. True. They don't give them away for free. They put them in sets to make the sets less valuable. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> But Beastmen have always made great sense in Old World, in AOS. I understand them in fantasy. In 40k, they always kind of get... They exist because we had to sell Zangor. Yeah, and like there's a few models here and there of those types of other races and Beastmen and that kind of stuff, but it's not really a thing. And you had to like really look in to figure out what Beastmen were supposed to be in 40k, and the references to them are like super rare, and most of them are so fucking old you assume they're not even more accurate anymore yeah this has beastmen chaos beastmen and they get explained properly as to what they are how they come to be for the most part and as a faction how beastmen are treated by both the imperium and chaos and i was like thank you this book did the thing beastmen <laughs> make more sense in 40k i am happier i understand my zangor now look at them all i get them is it a good reference is it portrayed in a way that's interesting beyond just your problem of you wanted anything it's basically what you'd assume this is later in the book where you get the explanation but this is like a baseline thing that has nothing to do with the book but it's essentially explained like beastmen are altered humans mutated humans whatever Right. Like an Ogryn or like a... A squat. Whatever other types of mutants, sure. And basically, in the Imperium, they're usually used as, like, slaves if they're not entirely killed off when found. Which I never really got, because, like, the Imperium already treats normal people like that generally anyways, so... Yeah, you, you get into that problem, though. Yeah, I agree with you, of when the Imperium is so shitty to everybody, it's hard to then say, and they treat these people even more shitty. Yeah. And you're 
you're you're like I've lost all feeling. You have six year olds mining coal. How do you make it worse? But they get into that aspect, and then that's why most of them end up as like worshiping the chaos gods, which is also hinted at probably being the thing that caused them to end up as beastmen anyway. Right, where it kind of like feeds in on itself of like they were outcast because of the slight changes, and then they found a potential out. If you're a human and you worship chaos gods, you end up mutated. Yeah, that's fair. That makes sense. I can understand the process. You get a couple views of Beastmen. Neat. Happy they were there. I don't expect that to be a commonality in 40k going forward, but... No, but they definitely seeded it. This is later in the book where this quote gets dropped, but this quote like made my inner businessman puke a little bit at how blatant it was where they were like, Beastmen are even capable warriors for any Imperial Guard officers who have the bravery to use them in units Ah. in their army list that is 2,000 points and sellable in the near future. I'm like, Jesus Christ, we get it. You want to add them to IG at some point. Right. Like, (laughs) here's the bullet point that was forced into the book. (laughs) Check mark, tick. Let's go. We gave them to Chaos, yes, but can we also give them to the Imperium? Right. Whatever. I mean, sure. (laughs) I don't care either way. I guess it would be neat to see some models like that, but... And while I'm talking about, like, little factoids that are later in the book, here's a a not spoiler for the book, and yet it will spoil the book if you are a thinking adult. Right. Like, A leads to B leads to C, obviously. This book is incredibly predictable in the way all 40k books I've read are. That's not really shocking. That's an overgeneralization, but essentially, 40k books, for the most part, are written like action movies. Yes. By the end of the first act, I was like, oh, this is where the first act ends. I can now write the rest of this book, and I know what the climax of the book will be based off the first act. Yeah. This is, end of act two is going to have this exact plot point that will then lead into this climax in act three. Nailed it. Right. It's just 40k. That's the writing quality of the stories. It's not that they're bad. It's that action things are written with certain arcs. You know the story. I feel like they could do better. I think some do better. To put it this way, we're going to be reading The Infinite and Divine. Right. I could not, at the end of Act 1, accurately predict the end of Infinite and Divine. Wah! We'll get into it. Could you predict the later parts of that book based off the first act of that book? No, but the epilogue or whatever. Sure, sure, sure. (laughs) That's different. (laughs) That's not the story for the book. Right. And that gets into the whole, I feel like it could be done less tropey, but it's on par with all the other decent 40k books for the most part. Right. It's fine. I don't hate that fact, but it's something that don't go in expecting to be shocked and wowed by the amazing twist and turning story. It's a 40k book. Honestly, there's nothing particularly wrong with like the beginning, middle, end, hit the climax, falling action, whatever it's called, and then resolution. Like that thing that we learned in seventh grade or whatever it was, the spiky line, it works. The dip at the end of the second act when the the lowest point for your hero before the third act climax. Yay. So before we get into a couple of my more specific thoughts from the predictability issue, I have one other major issue with this book that is systemic in 40k books. Chaos tax? No. This may be me to some extent. But I'm just going to throw this hot take out there. Books are an awful medium for action. Action scenes should not be written into books. They're fucking miserable at it. I disagree. It is the worst part of every book. I disagree. Generally, yes. There are some books that do it correctly, though, because they focus not just on the action as it's happening of like a bullet point, bullet point, bullet point type thing and hit like the emotions that are happening as the action is going on. I'm going through non 40k books that I've read. Yeah. And basically every one of them, I can think of the time when an action scene occurs being the point where I am the least interested in the book. Like it just becomes uh, like The Witcher with pirouette (laughs) being every third word in an action scene. Yeah, that is a large problem. Yes. Books are just not the medium for it you have books made for an action setting where they desperately wish they were action movies they have long drawn out scenes of men beating on each other and it's like 
no matter how well you illustrate the scene, how correctly written it is, at a certain point when I have to tax my mind to think about two slabs of meat going at each other for like 20 <laughs> minutes, three to four times a book, or he shoots his gun so well, the bullets fly so true, they smack into the wall missing the main bad guy because we can't kill him at this part of the book. I think that that is where I do agree with you. Those types of action scenes are generally the type of thing that you can just turn your brain off and read words and then get to where stuff picks back up. I have my hot take for the Dark Imperium trilogy, which I don't know if it's ever made it into one of our episodes, but this is a rule I came up with when I was talking to my brother about the series and i think it is a funny rule that kind of works okay if you're reading dark imperium oh i think i know what this is and the chapter begins with a space marine gilliman doesn't count he's a primarch that is not felix just hit skip you will lose (laughs) no story yeah you'll just lose some like bolter porn and it's part of i think that's because that's guy haley i think guy haley i don't know this fact but i get the feeling having read like six of his books now that he writes bolter porn like Shakespeare right where there is none of it and then the tax so that he doesn't get tomatoes thrown at him by the apes in the audience yes and then none of it and then the scene so you don't get tomatoes thrown at you and then the none of it and then the scene so you don't get tomato every so often throughout the book and I think that that is fair he shoots his gun so well it's like it could fire twice in a single shooting phase because he was so close no, just because that's the rule in 8th edition. They took it away in ninth, making this even funnier. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely don't go to Warhammer books for emotional fight scenes. Uh, No, and it's the weak point of this book is the fight scenes feel like I get it, move on. Yeah, which is unfortunate, but it's something I've always felt with 40k books. It's not a fault of this specific book. And again, you could be listening to this or watching this and saying, I don't agree with you. I'm only here for the action scenes. I skip past all the dialogue, character development and plot. Oh, there's definitely a lot of people that think you're insane. But that is not my jam, man. That's like my only real complaints with the book, which I the predictability is not a complaint. It's just a fact. Yeah, and I think that both of those types of complaints kind of disappear a certain amount. Like, if the book is reasonably well-written as literature and you have the understanding and expectation that it's not going to do something wild and there are going to be fight scenes that aren't going to really hit you anywhere other than gunfire, real fast, big explosion. And if you go into it with that, that's not a bad thing. Yeah, okay, so enough of the general stuff. Let's talk about, like, some specifics of the book. Okay. This is is later in the book where this specific quote occurs but it doesn't matter because it was in the arcs of omen thing and i am sure it's going to show up in every dark angels codex from this year forward the fallen is the name for the traitors of caliban whatever right yeah and now the lion is re-pulling them in under his banner and forgiving them and you definitely can't keep the name fallen and he even makes the joke of like the fallen is a terrible stupid name like it sounds so pretentious and you get a chuckle out of that because it's self-aware but then mike brooks got the note from the office that said by the way you have to rename the fallen too and he had to write the line i don't have the exact quote i'm not gonna pull it up but it was essentially you know them as the fallen but i know them as the risen oh i thought you were gonna say the redeemed or something like that i think it's the risen Okay. in this book, but I remembered it being the redeemed when I read Arcs of Omen. I don't know if they finalized which of the two is going to be the name. <laughs> they just knew it was an R. <laughs> and it was such a cliche, awful, gag-worthy line when he says it. And I'm right. like, oh my god. <laughs> Was, was it in like a uh, pre-battle chant, like hyping up something? I won't spoil the plotline portion, but you can guess how th- that line will get used. You've, you've watched an action movie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so I know that our audience, much like me, 
is filled with soulless pricks who have no fun in life. Yeah, I think that's a fair assumption. So when the lion got shown off, you, like me, got a good chuckle out of his 35-foot-long power sword that's Primark size that he somehow has five minutes after waking up, and the fact that he has the Emperor's shield, which I'm very happy. They blatantly said in the original interview where they were, like, showing him off, they were like, yeah, we decided internally that we were going to give every returning loyalist Primark a piece of the Emperor's equipment, but there wasn't one for the Primark, so we made up a shield. <laughs> And I was like, I appreciate how honest that was. Thank you. You didn't try to pull the cloth over on that one. Just accept it. You're just like, we made up a fucking shield, man. The Emperor, he's never had a shield in any artwork or mentioned it at all in the Horus Heresy series. He has a shield now. It's a cool shield, though. So you, like me, upon seeing this badass shield and this 45-foot-long sword that he has, yeah, he went, oh, I can't wait to see how they shoehorn him in getting these. <laughs> because <laughs> that's what my thought was when i saw them because i was like how the fuck does he end up with this shit <laughs> the funniest thing is that when you were originally like he's at a dream by the water i was like he's gonna pull the sword out of the fucking lake <laughs> no eric the sword doesn't come from the lake it okay. comes from my favorite plot point that is in the first act, so I'm allowed to talk about it. Okay, okay. I have called it Deus Ex Closet. It is the greatest moment in literature. It just opens up a random new closet and it's just like, oh, look, a badass sword that's 20 feet long. You are so correct, it hurts. No way. On this just like random backwater planet. So I don't get accused of making fun of this more than it should be. Ugh. I loved this moment. I actually loved it. I had to rewind because I was cackling like a madman. R right. Because audio. I could not hear the rest of the audiobook because I was laughing so hard <laughs> at what had just occurred as my brain broke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So in the first act, obviously you have to solidify the relationship between Lion and his new son. Okay, yeah. So they go on a quest to free the people from their oppressors, and it turns out it's chaos, guys. Surprise, surprise. Yeah, this sounds exactly like what I was saying originally. He goes on the epic journey, yeah. Yeah, so they're on a random backwater planet and freeing people from, like, random chaos dudes. Yeah. So they've got a pair of obliterators, which have you seen <laughs> the model? The big Hulk has a giant gun on its shoulder obliterators and he doesn't know it's an obliterator but he he like hand describes an obliterator to you and like got it i can picture the model thank you <laughs> <laughs> okay just like randomly has that that's fair sure and so those start fighting him and he's like damn i have no weapon i have to find a weapon but my son is pinned down i can't just run away and find a weapon i'll open this closet door he opens the closet door <laughs> And is back in the forest, the dream sequence thing. Yeah. And he takes like five steps and there's a sword in a stone. No. And he pulls the sword from the stone and it has Dark Angel's iconography on it. <laughs> it has his symbol. He pulls it from the stone. You know what? <laughs> I'm with you. I don't hate it. The only thing that could be better is if that wasn't a closet and it was a wardrobe <laughs> just to hit that extra little point on there. The lion, the witch in the wardrobe. <laughs> just really hit those early and get it out of the way. But out of a fucking stone. The main bad guy gets set up as a psyker, which are called witches. Yeah. So this book has a lion, a witch, and a closet. <laughs> and a closet. <laughs> Roll credits. <laughs> For some reason, is Mike Brooks American and just didn't realize that closets are called wardrobes? <laughs> so anyway, then the lion leaves the closet. <laughs> thank you. I'll give <laughs> it to you. That's all the laugh I'm getting out of that. But I'll give you. it to you. <laughs> so that's how he gets fealty, which is what he ends up calling the sword because all swords need a name. And that's what he named it, really? It's an expression of his fealty and the fealty of his sons being redeemed, re-offering themselves to the Emperor. It's not a bad sword name. There's worse. Well, okay, in 40k where things are called, like, Dark Angels, Angel of Absolution, whatever, whatever... <laughs> 
yeah, fine. It's fair. So that's how he gets his sword in the first act. And I can't talk about the shield. I wonder if Excalibur is not trademarked or anything, is it? I don't think it can be. That's why you can use it in like fucking random animes and shit, which is why they couldn't use it because they couldn't trademark it. They need to be able to have that as part of, yeah. I just love that in 30k, he had like a famous important sword, but Cypher has it. So they couldn't give it to him in 40k because a famous fallen has it. So they're like, well, so we had to give him a new sword. So we gave him this one. Cypher, obviously. Yeah. Not Cypher pole. That's a different thing entirely. <laughs> Don't fuck it up, Luffy. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, that's a, that's a weird cross that happened. Chaos got real crazy, but I see it. There's also a fun moment talking about the power sword. There's a fun moment in this book that had never clicked for me until this moment in this book. I'm aware I Googled it afterwards and this has been brought up in other books, so I don't feel bad talking about it. But there is a, a fantastic like space marine officer type showing off slicing through enemies with his power sword showing off how good he is at swordsmanship okay and one of the like stock space marines makes the snarky comment of typical fucking officer if any of us had that sword we could do that you jackass you're just the only one equipped with it and i was like that's a great point and then they like make an offhand mention of like yeah only officers get power swords because they're ultra hard to make that's why the rest of us get chain swords because you just need to be able to hit the xenos and they die meanwhile i'm just like you know what what's really dumb bringing a sword to a gunfight that's 40k incarnate you can't have that logic how the officers always carried a rapier with them in fucking world war one you can't talk about logic with 40k and yeah not realizing they all have guns yeah you know i'm fine with it the swords are cool they are so i don't care but <laughs> And while I can't say anything about the ending, I will say I fucking loved it. And it was one of my favorite things in the book. And you know he ends up with Dante. Like, that's the public information, Arcs of Omen. That's where he ends up. As someone who read Dante, Devastation of Ball, and all that stuff, god damn, the end of this book is good. I really fucking love Dante, man. Yeah. And, like, we actually, there is, like, not just five minutes of end credits. Hey, Dante's here. It's an end credit sequence. Okay, but you just love Dante so much that it's like, it's good enough for you. It's such a correct reaction. <laughs> it's accompanied by more emotion and other things being said. Okay. It just pulled on all the right heartstrings, and I was like, fuck, I actually care about these characters. Holy shit, these are space marines and I like them. And I guess since I've talked about it a couple times now, I should point out, like, a chunk of this is devoted to the lion coming to terms with the fact that he is suddenly a psyker, to some extent. Oh, yeah? Because, like, he now has his forest walk ability, which is, like, his ability in 40k now if you like play his new model where he has like his ability to just planes walk essentially <laughs> it sounds a lot like planes walking yeah essentially he walks through like the warp forest path that reminds him of caliban and he walks through it <laughs> and goes to different places. I wonder what it's going to look like next time. That will be interesting because in Arcs of Omen, it's revealed that Caliban has become Wormwood. Yeah. And it's like an all-mech world, but that should already be the case when this book takes place. It's not that earlier. So I don't know if what he's walking through is like the real Caliban that is in the warp or if because he is a Primarch level psyker, he has created this on accident over 10,000 years. I don't know what the forest is. I would be surprised if anybody knows until it's done and it's just being left open kind of thing. They may never fully explain it and just leave it as like, uh, figure it out. Close enough. I like how things are more open-ended like that, but I also like on the opposite end of things. I love that they don't mince words. And because you have Lion, who's from 30k, and a bunch of renegades who don't agree with the 40k Imperium, you get a lot of the Imperium is a shithole. It sucks. It is the worst it has ever been. It had problems in 30k. It's an awful shithole in 40k. They somehow made things worse. Yes. And I appreciate that standpoint of like the matter of fact external view like Gilliman has it, which I've always appreciated. But from Gilliman's perspective, he's essentially alone on that because everyone else he talks to is from the Imperium. Like, even other space marines are current day space marines. These are space marines from 30k who don't have any loyalty to 40k Imperium. Right. That is a more unique perspective. I appreciate the, like, unabashed look 
at how shitty the Imperium is, where it's not filtered through characters who are like, oh, I love, you know, working 45 hours a day and dying by the age of 20. Yeah, it's great. You end up with a lot of those in Imperium focus books, and I prefer this perspective so much more of just not fucking doing that. Right. I mean, part of why it's cool is because it's different. And from Lions, like, interesting perspective of being a 30k person you get a bunch of like fish out of water moments that are cute where he's like trying to make a joke about one of the other primarchs and no one gets it except for like the space marines who will never chuckle at anything it's an in joke you had to be there I appreciate that and like his general feelings on all his brothers. You get a pretty good feeling of how he feels about every one of his brothers throughout this book at some point. The ones he respects, the ones he doesn't respect but still wishes was alive, stuff like that. Like, yeah. he randomly badmouths Gilliman <laughs> five times because it's funny. Right. <laughs> That's the kind of thing that, like, it does help solidify humanity in characters, where it's like, they're more than just the facade of bullet points, this is what happened. It's like, they have feelings and backstories and there's reasons. And I like that he reflects on, like, their relationships in 30k and is intelligent enough to, like, he's like, I fucking hated Gilliman. Also, I really wish Gilliman was here. <laughs> He's like, Gilliman was an insufferable prick who was way too good at logistics. Jesus Christ, this place needs logistics. Right. He would have actually been pretty useful right now. Still hate him. I hate him, but damn, I wish he wasn't dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. That's, that's kind of neat. Okay. I think this is my final point. We've rambled for a while now. I've kind of just said my thoughts as I finished this book hours ago. It's getting to be hours ago now. Two hours and five minutes ago. <laughs> I was like, it was 20 minutes ago when we started, but uh, looking over at that recording time, yeah, hours ago, sounds right. Back to my inability to pronounce words. Yeah, which one is it this time? This is not my fault. This is the fault of the British Isles. <laughs> okay. So this is something that I have quietly known as like a trope in 40k books, just in the back of my head, and it didn't solidify until this book. So 40k books all have a bad habit of a word they over repeat. In The Infinite and Divine, when we get there, it's death masks. Have fun with that. You replace all face with death mask. Nailed it. Yeah. I've read most of my Space Marine books I like through Guy Haley, and there is one word that I've always felt he overused in those books to describe Space Marines, which is preternatural, which the English want to pronounce as pre to natural instead of preternatural, which is the actual pronunciation. I double checked that I did not fail English, and that is how it is pronounced on the internet when I use the pronunciation guide. But for some reason, the English pronounce it pre to natural, which just means superhuman or beyond natural. I know what the word is, but I feel like neither of those pronunciations are what I think it is, so. Yeah, preternatural is the pronunciation. Fair enough. Learn something every day. pre to natural abilities. It's mentioned a lot in yeah. 40k books for Space Marines. This book made it 90% of the way through the book without using it. And then it used it. And I had to pause as I came to terms with the fact I just told you of not only do I know this word gets overused with Space Marines and it just happened in this book and it all clicked together for me, but also that's not how you pronounce this word, right? I'm not insane and I am not insane. The British are idiots. I'm just imagining that the narrator has like a lot of pauses and doesn't keep things smooth going to give emotion or whatever. And it sounded to you like actually like pre too natural. They all do it. Multiple narrators. They make it sound like they're saying three words. Yeah. His pre to natural abilities. Things like that actually can be a downside to having books read to you. I don't want to make it sound like I dislike the narrator. The narrator for this was Timothy Watson, and he did a fantastic job. There was a lot of different voices to do. Voices I was able to keep track of multiple characters in scenes. None of them sound like Aramon in the Aramon books, which is just the fucking worst. So I'm <laughs> happy about that, too. It is one of those that, like, when things are generally good on audiobooks, and then you get that, like, one 
one instance of like pre too natural type thing yeah it can like pull you out it just like breaks everything and at least for me like when that happens i have to like pause my brain thought and go hold on that's not three separate words put it together what do we have oh i understand now and now i've missed five seconds of story similar one off topic but on topic twice dead king it's read by richard reed who to me is the voice of necrons absolutely fantastic he is for the infinite and divine he is for twice dead king yep he's just necrons to me fantastic of voices the beginning of twice dead king i don't know if the script slash book itself had typos when he was reading it yeah or if he misread, then stopped, then reread the line. He did that multiple times, and in the final cut of the audiobook on Audible that I listened to, yeah, it's in there, where he'll read a line, and it doesn't make English sense, and then he'll reread the line correctly. Really? And it's in the book. And it happened like, there was like two grammatical errors in the first 35 40 minutes and i was like oh no this is gonna be a fucking catastrophe then it never happened again huh it's like there was like two grammar issues early on in the script or like day one while they're recording he's like bro get me a fucking rev two of this yeah or they just when they were editing it and doing all of the cuts they just were asleep for that first 30 minutes it was like 6 a.m you just get to the office you haven't had your coffee you get past that part and then you start sailing yeah, it likely is just because of, like, the editing just... Yeah, it happens. Think of how many times we've redone a line in this episode. <laughs> Apparently a 10,000-year nap is all it takes for him to realize he was acting like a hormonal... Hor- hormonal. Like a whore. Like a whore. Hormonal. A whore. Horm- hormonal? Hormonal. <laughs> how do you, you say that word? You ruined the word now. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we don't retake the line and we just make a new one because we don't know English. <laughs> Sometimes we say pre to natural. <laughs> Manatees. <laughs> that's not even from this podcast. That's our other one. No, it isn't. Oh. Pengalin. Pengalin. <laughs> ruined a fucking animal for me forever (laughs) oh all right on that note we have discussed this enough we have rambled enough it has been like almost two hours for us who knows how much of it made the final cut i look forward to listening back to this after it's been edited (laughs) i do too because i feel bad for our editor please give them all due respect in the comments section we gave them a wild ride to work with and turn this into a coherent thought this was an experimental episode of just me rambling after reading a book and wanting to talk about a character and my love-hate relationship with the things going on in 40k lore if you liked it tell us if you hated it tell us it's fine i'm fairly confident that when we do the actual book club review of infinite divine it's going to be a bit better way different because i get to actually talk about the whole book without worrying about spoilers i can have notes where i'm not just going off the cuff 25 minutes after i read the book at least both of us will have actually read the book for me three times now overachiever (laughs) i liked the book and you were reading it so i reread it all right we're getting a little loopy let's get out of here for the week sounds good